I just, just want to kind of get a get an understanding of when major depression is said for any mood disorder, what does that mean? And I, I understand you have done a little, little research on that, have you I, not? I have. Um, so mood is more like your emotional tone and it influences a person's outlook of either their self or others. And these actually used to be called affective disorders, which was what we saw when people had these mood issues, we would see it from the outside. So um, mood is more of an internal emotion. Wonderful, wonderful. So when we say affect, what does that mean? The outward expression of the outward mood. Expression. So if we are looking at a weather of a town, it's a persistent, you say, well, in Arizona it's warm, right? So in Pennsylvania it can be cold. So that's the persistent state. But on a day in December, it can be 80 degrees as well, right? But that, that doesn't mean that's the way it is. It can change very quickly. Mm -hmm. So our affects are our state of appearances, and our moods are state of being, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So when we have to make the diagnosis of major depression, what are some of the criteria to say this is what qualifies to have major depression? There is um, there's a criteria from the DSM-5 and it says that a person has to have these symptoms for at least two weeks and the, it has, they either have to have um, depression or anhedonia is one of them. But I also found this, um, it's kind of a quick reference and it's like a, just something to quickly remember the criteria for uh, major depressive and it's SIGI caps and like the SIG for prescription. So it was something fun to kind of easily remember. And some of it is sleep disturbances. They can have uh, insomnia or hypersomnia. The interest, which is usually loss of interest. They usually have guilt. They usually have decreased energy. Usually decreased concentration. Their appetite can be increased or decreased. And that represents a greater than 5% weight loss change of either increase or decrease within a month. Um, psychomotor agitation and suicidal ideation. There's some of the criteria. And Peter alluded to that suicide as a risk uh, earlier on, which is very significant. Uh, I, I, I just saw somebody today, and it's very interesting. She said, I want to live, but I don't want to be living. I just end my life, might as well end my life the way the life is. And uh, I, I hear that all the time. It's a pain of depression that causes people to say, I want to give up. And that's actually pain of almost anything, right? Uh, so suicide is really an integral part of people's getting, feeling so helpless and hopeless, they don't know how to come out of that state of mind. Maybe that, that really is what happened, right? Ruthann, anything you would like to add to how you see depressions and your... Dr. Sean, <clears throat> oftentimes whenever I uh, meet with a person who is suffering from depression, uh, they are experiencing pain. And whenever you made the comment of uh, living, uh, difficulty living, it is uh, whenever I wake up in the morning, you know, what's the day going to be like? And how much effort uh, does it take uh, to do morning hygiene, to pick up the phone, to make a, a phone call? Those are the, uh, the kinds of stories that I do hear whenever I'm, I'm working with a person suffering. And I use the word suffering with depression. There is pain in that person. And it is not only physical, emotional, as well as spiritual pain. The total person is involved. Yes. Did you hear that person we did a telepsychiatry session today? What did he call God? He called him a dick. Isn't that beautiful? It could be angry at God too. Very angry. Very angry. Because no. oftentimes we think of God as, hey, get us out of this mess. Yes. Or, hey, where are you? Yes. And, and how did I get into this mess? Why didn't you help me? That's Very right. much a part of So we get disappointed. Very much so. From everything and anything, yes. and including our spiritual being. So he was, he was, would you say that he was very angry or? He was. Um, he, he was. He was angry at God. He felt like God should fix his problems. And he said he accepted his problems 
but part of me felt like he didn't understand the concept of accepting how he felt. That's right. So sometimes with this, you know, well, the things that we don't want in our life and we have them, that causes stress. And the things that we don't, we want to have in our life and we don't have them, that causes stress. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the things we don't want, we have them. The things that we don't want, or we want, we, we just don't get them. And that creates a state of conflict in the mind's mindscape, you know. Uh, Jim, do you have any thoughts uh, of, of how some of the time that you have seen people coming in with and presenting with depression? Yes, uh, quite often people come in with presenting issues, presenting problems that may not be the underlying true cause that they're having distress or dysfunction in their lives. And people have a need to be heard, Dr. John Ray. Heard, not listened to. You can listen to the radio and not remember a song that was played 20 minutes ago. When you're with a person and you hear them, take a phenomenological view of their life through their eyes to get a better understanding of the position where they're at now and help them to understand that there is hope and that there's a, there's a person to assist them in a partnership on their journey to wellness. So, so you're talking about the treatment aspect? Yes. Uh, I still want to kind of stay on the aspect of how people present. So if there's somebody who ha who's now uh, 14 years old and has a first bout of depression, how might that they present to us? It could be um, that their demeanor changes from a stable one to one of irritability and confusion. Um, there could also be evidence with respect to their loved ones that they simply aren't behaving normally. Um, and those, those changes are frequently observed and first commented on by their family. Right, right, right. And what are the kids doing at that age? What are they doing at that age? Um, Work-wise. What work do they do? Work-wise, they're going to school. School. What happens to school? Schoolmates uh, sometimes see these changes uh, even more quickly than their parents, because some of the difficulties arise at school. Right. So, so part of the things, all the psychiatric conditions or diagnosis should make create a dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not due to. What else we have to rule out? Medical on? conditions. Medical, Medical conditions. conditions. What else? Uh, substance use. Substance use. And it should cause dysfunction. So I may have all the symptoms of what you just talked about, but if I'm functioning well, it really is not causing a dysfunction. So in psychiatry, criteria is also that it should cause a significant dysfunction in people's life to qualify for a diagnosis and a treatment that, that we need to do. So it goes back to at different times in life, it behaves differently, right? So somebody who is in school, what else can happen? Uh, they could be more defiant toward their defiant, teachers. Defiant, yeah, or, toward the teacher, yes. Mm, or their other classmates, um, like getting um, altercations. Altercations to their anger and frustration, they're not being able to function. What else? I'm looking for another key thing to thank. Uh, their grades. Grades, That's yeah, right. their grades are dropping. So often the first question we would ask is, you know, uh, how are you doing at school? I mean, after knowing all that, I want to know how are they doing at school? <coughs> you know, I mean, I used to be an honor student, now I'm C's and D's and failing. You know, that's very important and pertinent, you know, knowing that. Okay. So how one might present if they are adults, grown up? Adult-wise, they could not be as Right, so be yeah. wonderful, wonderful. So they may be so preoccupied in their own self, they are unable to take care of their essential needs at home. If it's a mom who's taking care of two young children, I actually have a mother. She so as soon as the kids come back home in the evening, I'm so petrified of them coming home, and I should love them, but I can't stand them. You know? And she says, I just don't know what to do because I just don't know how to manage them because of the depression that caused that amount of kind of despair. What else adults, if somebody's working, say, as a teacher in a school, how it might affect, depression might affect their teaching? Uh, they might, when they're uh, grading 
according to the grades down, they might just accidentally give them a different score than they're supposed to. They may make mistakes. Yeah. You know, they may make mistakes. They may not be able to function well and they got right up. I actually have a teacher in our practice uh, whose personal life became problematic, depression sets in. Now she was called after being a very great teacher for many years. <clears throat> now her uh, principal called her in and said, you know, well, uh, she got disciplined and she was so petrified of losing her job. Okay, so functioning wise. And older people, I mean, somebody who's 70 years old or 50 years old, Ruth and how might they have some difficulties in eh, presenting symptoms? Well, I have several patients who are uh, over 55 and, and they have difficulty, uh, again, organizing their lives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. isolating themselves from their friends. Absolutely. Not wanting to go out and yes. and play bingo, for example. Absolutely. And and so that isolation uh, creates uh, more difficulties for them. Absolutely, that's wonderful. We have some thoughts that you got up to share. Yes, and you're talking about older adults. Yes. Oh, in particular, uh, memory, lack of focus, <coughs> ability to concentrate, uh, disturbed sleep patterns. Yes. Let's stick with the memory for a second. Wonderful. People think that they're having Alzheimer's and dementia. They really are not. It's a depression setting in and causing a memory impairment, which looks like that, right? You know, okay. I, I'm looking for one more answer about uh, uh, older uh, people presenting symptoms. Mm, prolonged like, sleep, they don't want to get out of bed sometimes. One more thing. Um, there could also be like a somatic. Yeah, yes, wonderful. Bit. Somatic, such as. Um, if someone presents with a chronic abdominal pain, yes. or if somatic is like a body response to what you're what you're feeling yes. psych psychologically. So, if you have a chronic abdominal pain, for example, and uh, your workup uh, lab and image wise is totally negative, and you know if you have other um, affect or mood changes as well, it could Absolutely. be due to your depression. Absolutely, that's so very important. A lot of physical symptoms, back pains, constipation, uh, you know, headaches, tooth pains, a lot of physical symptoms. So it can be very confusing for primary care physicians because you can do million dollar workup and you have not entertained the diagnosis of potential depression, then you are missing the point. And, and that's the nature of knowing that we keep our minds open. Just the way we in psychiatry would keep our minds open if somebody can present as depression, what medical conditions can look like depression? Uh, substance abuse. Substance abuse. So always look for some uh, serum of truth. What is the serum of truth? Okay. Urine. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's called a serum of truth. You get a little serum of truth and analyze that. And if there is anything called opium and cocaine and narcotics, it gives you some more additional information. Okay, so if somebody comes in and they say, well, uh, uh, and I, I would sometimes get people who are intoxicated sitting in front of me and I ask them, you know, when was their last drink? And they would say, oh, about a month ago. <laughs> and I'm getting intoxicated from their breath. So if you find somebody who has urine, which comes back positive for cocaine or something else, and they have presented with depression, how would you manage that? What, what would you tell them? Oh, actually, I'm going to... How would you manage that? And I'm switching, I'm sorry. How would you manage that? Somebody, you did a urine drug screening, mm -hmm. and they told you that they never used any drugs all their life. Mm -hmm. And it came back positive for a couple, three drugs. How would you manage them in the moment? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't jump on top of it, say like, you know, why? Why would you like me about it? But I will basically walk them, walk into it, slowly, yeah. step by step, so then they feel comfortable enough. Absolutely. Good enough. That's all I wanted to hear. So it's really no different than if I go to a cardio, uh, my primary care doctor for a routine checkup, and they do my cardiogram, and it, it reveals severe cardiac damage. Should my primary care doc jump on me? No, they don't, right? You know, they do, you know, my liver function test and they came back sloppy, right? You know, so 
So our approach to, I mean, nobody wants to have a heart attack, right? You know, but yet we can have a cardiac, severe cardiac condition. Somebody who's peeing a lot and, you know, you, you know is out of their element, and then they, they find out that they are diabetic. Well, their urine and blood, blood glucose maybe is 750. Would you, you wouldn't jump on their throat, right? What would you do? Just the way Omer said, you know, you are being kind to understand. So part of the pathology of people's substance abuse is, you know, that they tend to lie. They tend to hide facts, and that's part of their pathology. You know? And we have to just understand that as the way things are. And recognizing, you know, that causes a lot of shame and guilt anyway. And if you, as a provider, also make them shameful and guiltful, you're really not doing any service. You know? And Peter had a patient a while ago. Um, they had, he had narcotic dependence, and he went to like a couple different places and eventually landed here. And the differentiating point of being there and here was that we treat everyone with respect and dignity. Right? Yes. And, and that's the... difference too. Yeah, that makes a big difference. So... I'd like to add a point. Um, earlier today, we saw a patient uh, who is so intelligent that his self-diagnosis of his own conditions impresses us constantly. And I thought of this first when Kaylin was going over that wonderful um, acronym that lists the symptoms. Um, only a PA student could fall in love with an acronym that lists <laughs> the symptoms. We have patients, very intelligent patients, who come in here and say, here's what's happened to me in the last two months. And they basically go through that acronym, how it was two months ago and how it is at present. Their self-diagnosis of their own symptoms is impressive. That, of course, is at variance with people who have no clue as to what is going on with them. All they know is they're not feeling as well as before. What I'm saying is the range of understanding and self-appreciation as among and between our patients is enormous. Absolutely. And that takes me to actually a very wonderful point. So part of our C clear form, you know, uh, thinking process is, you know, that we want people to be empowered with knowledge and understanding, because it's their bodies and their difficulties, right? And and it's so very vital that that is honored. And it could be anything, whether it's a substance abuse, depression, panic attacks, you know, bipolar disorder. But those conditions make us feel very uncomfortable and very fearful. And, and we don't, I mean, none of us like to have that fear in our heart, right? Yeah. And our goal is to transfer that fear to knowledge and wisdom and practical way of getting better. Because that's really, it's, it's transformational idea, you know, as a marriage started, you know, we, we don't jump on their self. We say, oh, we have a problem. Your urine came back with positive two drugs, which can cause some depression. And they can also be very difficult for mood in many other ways. And let's talk about that. You know? It was probably not divine intervention. It may have been something else that caused it. Absolutely. Now, now, now what I want to do is, you know, we should not even have a sarcastic <laughs> opinion about that. You know, because our patients are very sensitive to that. You know, especially when it comes to drugs of addiction. That we would say, oh, where did that come from? Well... Have, have you and I not eaten foods which were terrible? Tell me if anybody around here has eaten food that they shouldn't have eaten. Right? Okay. Tell me if anybody here who have always said the truth and nothing but the truth always in their life. Please raise your hand. Okay. Pretty quiet. Yes, yeah, pretty <laughs> quiet. I want to also know if there's somebody who can say that, you know, they didn't steal anything that didn't belong to them. Even if it's a pen or a... Or a or a pen. Anybody who didn't, never stole anything that didn't belong to them. Okay, so we all are thieves, liars, <laughs> sitting around. So we should not be passing any judgment to nobody else, right? So when people come in with their own challenges and we know better, we have to be very kind and, and have the humility of knowing that people do what they do and it's our job to help them become better. Okay, so differential diagnosis. Substance abuse, what else? Fairly quick. So what else can cause depression, but really is not depression by? Um, you know it. Any endocrine? Hypothyroidism. Oh, hypothyroid. Endocrine. So think of organs in general. Okay. So rather than looking at just the thyroid, 
think think of endocrine system. So when the endocrine system, thyroid, pituitary, hypothalamus, down to adrenal cortex, you know, all of those can have malfunction and thus depression like state. I actually have an accountant in my practice who was diagnosed with that depression, but she had hypo hypo uh, adrenalism. And, and it wasn't diagnosed until later in life. What else can cause depression-like state, which really is not a medical condition? If you don't know it, don't worry. I'll just kind of work through that. Uh, and women, in particularly, of childbearing age. Monthly cycles. Anemias. Anemia is a very common in women as, as, as a presenting symptom of tiredness, you know, don't want to get up and do anything. They will fit in all those criteria. And, and yet really they are anemic. So always checking their anemia is very important. What other vitamin can cause? Well, what other vitamin can cause a depression-like state if it's less? Yes. Just give me one vitamin. Is there more than one? But the one that you know. Vitamin? Vitamin D. Vitamin D, yes. In this part of the country, we are very low in vitamin sunshine and thus the exposure and the manufacturing of the vitamin D in our skin. So thiamine, uh, B12s, and all those kind of things can cause you know, a depression-like state, but that really is not depression. So, so the invitation is to kind of think that not what shows up is always that. If you're sitting in a psychiatric office, you can have an anemia presenting to you, an adrenal cortex insufficiency presenting to you. It can also cause, you know, uh, can be, you know, thyroid insufficiency, parathyroid gland insufficiency, so the number of things. So we have to keep our mind very open as a clinician and not look at DSM-5 as the only methodology. It may not be depression, but presents as depression, right? And if you're sitting in a general physical exam, you know, in, into a primary care doctor's office, a neurology, neurology office, you know, think of, you know, what other things can cause depression-like state and then and other than the neurological condition, you know. So uh, as rare condition as uh, 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 cancer of the pancreas, pancreatic head can cause depression as the first symptom before it manifests itself. There's a weight loss, appetite kind of thing, you know, you don't feel like eating everything like depression, but it really is the pancreatic head's cancer. Okay. So we have to be very open to the the idea because otherwise we can start doing therapy forever and actually kill an individual and that's not effective treatment. So so first task is to know our sciences and know them very well. Mm -hmm. Then doing the differential diagnosis and knowing that how to do the differential diagnosis. And then the treatments. So how do we treat depression? I think that you have a bunch of slides. We'll come back to the slides in a few moments. But I just want to kind of lay out the picture of how we treat people. Uh, how do we treat people? When you, you mentioned earlier treating people with courtesy. Yes, that's being nice. And being non judgmental. Absolutely. And that recovery from anything is a process and not an event. Okay, okay. So it's a process of getting better. You know, yes. you're diagnosed with diabetes, it's a process of getting better from that, you know. So being nice, what else do we do? Therapies. Therapies. So that would be part of the therapy. You know, we do some different kind of therapies. So name name some some therapies for me. Well, we do the the DBT here. What does DBT stand the for? The dialectic behavioral therapy. Hmm, what's that? Never heard of it. Um, it's concentrating on your emotions and looking at them in a different way. Okay. Very good. For Dave, week one. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so different kind of therapies. You know, so all therapies work very well. Um, can you name some therapies other than DBT that works in depression? Cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT, yes. Yes, yes. very good. Very good. Reality therapy. Reality uh, therapy. Gestalt therapy. Gestalt therapy. So the different kinds of therapies which work in depression. And what are some of the other things that we have to do to treat people other than therapies? Uh, pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy. So pharmacotherapies, give me some names of them. Uh, there are like SSRIs uh, and SNRIs and different things like that. Absolutely. So the easy way to remember these things is, you know, that if, if you have hypertension, use antihypertensive. If you have uh, an infection, use antibacterial. Put an anti before that and it becomes your treatment, right? You know, if you have diarrhea, anti-diarrheal. <laughs> and so as a clinician, you can say something that will come back those conditions, antidepressants, are of different kinds, and they, they're very effective. There's a time and place for antidepressants to work. 
Other biological treatments include ECT. Uh, we are using now alpha stimulation treatment with a lot of success in our office, which is a micro currents which stimulates the brain to be calmer and less depressed, less anxious, and more effective. Um, and uh, uh, and then it becomes the science becomes harder, but nevertheless, antidepressants work. You know, uh, we talk about therapies and what else we need to do uh, to be effective for people's treatments. One thing that helps frequently is listening carefully yes. to find out what is going on in their lives that may well have depressed them. Absolutely, the psychosocial issues, you know. Um, then I just want to kind of highlight something and that let it be. Uh, this will be almost like a format that we will always look at treatments. Treatments are psycho, uh, uh, biological, okay. then treatments are uh, psychological, and then the treatments are psychosocial. Okay. So if I'm a teacher and I have lost my job and I don't have money coming in, what are, what's my immediate need if I don't have money coming in? Right. And after that panic, what do we do? What is a therapist supposed to do for somebody who doesn't have the money coming in and they are depressed and they are out of, not able to work? Support. Support in what ways? Uh, and their, and their emotions back up. And okay. Down. Well, it would not feed their family and pay their check, pay their rent, right? Would it? No. Okay. If you say, oh, I love you and I love you too much, would that pay their bills? Yeah. Sorry? Walter. Welfare. So some ways to support their ability, right? So we spend a lot of time completing people's paperwork, you know, disability paperwork, making sure you know they're able to connect with the right right resources and able to find their way. Because if they don't, if they're going to be evicted from their home, and the antidepressant prescription you have given, they cannot fill it. So what good is that, right? So psychosocial intervention is very important, bringing families in together to be able to understand, you know, your loved one is struggling with depression. He's mean, but his meanness is not because he's a bad person. He just is struggling with that depression that, that needs treatment, right? So psychosocial interventions are very important. But different than if somebody's diabetic, we do psychosocial intervention by helping them understand how the treatment for diabetes is, right? And then we also help them, you know, bring the family in and say, well, this is a diabetes, it's a treatable condition, right? And but here's what it needs to be done. We need to make sure the blood work is done. We make sure, you know, the glucose is okay. We make sure, you know, the nutrition is right. And that's a part of the process of helping people become better, right? Because either you, if you don't have the knowledge, you become stressed out. So we have some very research-based, exciting, uh, you know, thing that Peter has prepared about some of the newer theories about how depression behaves and why they do what they do. So he's going to show us a bit of, bit of that and... And I think that these are very exciting times uh, in, 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 the, in the field of psychiatry and the field of medicine in general. And we say that it's a, it's a lifestyle change that we are embarking upon. And so these slides will show some of those emerging sciences that I think almost all of us need to know to become more wiser in managing some of very severe conditions, which can be life-threatening or life-exciting. So those are the two options. Are you ready for your slides?